So if what is the, what the Tatz is writing with the German newspaper is true, this must be really bad. One of the journalists told me that when we were talking about the case Hannibal a couple uh, weeks ago. What we mean by that is the research that a number of journalists have undertaken um, amongst them, a research team from the TATS who worked on this for two years and who unveiled something that was, is almost impossible to believe. What is this about? This is amongst one of the things is the special forces um, officer who stole 60,000 um, pieces of ammunition and hid it in his garden to be ready for day X. There were soldiers who kept uh, lists of uh, hits where journalists and politicians were listed as enemies to be killed. It is about a club that offered paramilitary um, to uh, a secret chat group of people, which is illegal in Germany, by the way. This sounds like a really bad thriller from the station bookshop. But this is reality. This is Germany in 2019. The next two speakers are part of the team from the TATS who uncovered all of this and researched this intensively for, and extensively for two years and rightfully so got many prizes for this. Please welcome Sebastian Erb and Daniel Schulz who will tell you about the affair Hannibal or the Hannibal Affair. Hi, welcome. Uh, we're so excited to be in this big room, I mean, hall, stadium. Uh, us, that's uh, Daniel Schulz to my right and Sebastian Erb. Our uh, talk is called the Hannibal Affair. We're talking about a network of soldiers and policemen, members and officer, um, members of the federal offices uh, that are part of the right wing. And with this network, we've spent the past two years and uh, uncovered a lot. And by now, we have a hashtag. Hashtag Hannibal is kind of can't become the chiffre or like symbol of what's going wrong in the so-called security services. Uh, what do you mean, right-wing network in the army? Was there something? Let's ask this person. Especially now, we, until now, we have not found right-wing networks amongst the German army is not part of the German army. This is Christoph Gramm. He is the president of the military counterintelligence service, which is the secret service of the army. And he said this in a hearing in November 2018, on the 16th of November in 2018. This was the annual hearing of the heads of the intelligence services in the parliament and uh, the advisory body, supervisory body, which uh, takes place once a year, and this time it was public. Usually it takes place in secret. Um, this timing is quite interesting and peculiar because it is, takes place directly between two publications, between a time where Focus and Tuts, both two new publications, published articles about this network. And the Focus and the Tuts, and you, you it might be surprising, we're not really a research uh, group together, we independently researched the subject matter and we are asking today what has happened since then, what has changed, what would and what will um, Mr. Gramm say about this subject today. This network that we're talking about today um, that is referred to as Hannibal's Shadow Network, it's a secret network of men. Uh, on the one hand in chat groups, but also uh, outside of the internet. And those are men that want to defend the state, claim to defend the state, but mistrust the, mistrust the state and actually endanger the state. At the center of this network, we find a man, he's called Andre S. And he's in his early 30s. He is uh, part of the German army as a master sergeant. Um, he's not just one soldier, he's an elite soldier, part of the special forces. They do the toughest deployments when it comes to hostage, into, like um, questioning or hunting terrorists in Afghanistan. The in German abbreviated to KSK is um, acting in secret. Um, only the parliament will be formed after um, a like a deployment has happened. Um, but they also do advertise on YouTube and uh, Alexa. 
So he calls himself, refers to himself as Hannibal. This has nothing to do with elephants. This is goes back to Hannibal from the A Team, the TV show. <laughs> oh, what's on this? Um, I love it when a plan works. And then now we hear the soundtrack from the A Team. Um. Hannibal uh, is connected in all sorts of chats with other um, mind kinded, kind kindred spirits, and they talk about safe houses, hoarding food, or finding flight plans for um, a moment of catastrophe. This catastrophe is uh, the so-called day X. It can be a lot of things like natural catastrophe, like a Russian invasion, um, or a racist idea such as a migrant in invasion um, into Germany. Um, to be ready for this day, um, some of these radicalized members, um, they believe it's OK to be hoarding uh, weapons and kill um, political opponents and keep lists of enemies. Hannibal founded a club, which is called Uniter.ev, which is short for a club. It's an NGO, as they like to call themselves. It's a professional network of active and former members of the special forces, partially of the army, the police force. And this is their official uh, image. Um, but behind the curtain, there's quite a different story to be told. Um, a lot of people who've left the, the club um, are calling it a cult, actually. Um, this club um, trained civilians in military tactics. And um, they've worked on building um, an armed part of this club, so an armed forces of the club itself. And the club itself has, is not afraid to um, have relations with questionable um, officials such as like the president of the Philippines, Duterte, who is known for uh, being an autocrat who um, kills supposed drug criminals without having a trial. The club Uniter itself is not a right-wing terrorist group, but right-wing terrorists do feel quite cozy there. This is maybe how you could uh, lawfully, correctly state this. Uh, Franco A was also part of a member. He's a, a former army member that pretended to be a Syrian refugee and uh, planned attacks, and he's going to be set on trial soon. Um, part of the Hannibal Network, there was also the two people from the so-called North Cross group, and two of these are being suspected by the Eternal General currently to be planning right-wing terrorist actions. Uh, the founder, Marco G., of this North Cross uh, network is currently on trial in Schwerin, and he has been, uh, he, he has been um, prosecuted for um, illegally owning guns and ammunition. Um, we're using the male form here on purpose. This is not a generic masculine. Um, as far as we know, there's barely any women. Um, if there are any women, it's the wives. They don't actually have any active part. This is an elitist bound of circle of men. Um, here we can see a simplified illustration of this network, of how we research this. Uh, you can see that at the center there's Hannibal that founded a few different things, so these kind of prepper chats that were uh, organized by the different directions, north, east, south, west. Um, so in the north, the uh, people from North Cross, North Cross, and then also that we can find groups in Austria and Switzerland. Um, he founded the club, the Uniter, where a bunch of members um, are of interest. We left a lot of things out, like who of these are Freemasons, um, and some of them are also uh, police and are part of the Order of Lazarus, and important is that the network is not a strict organizational hierarchical structure. It's not one leader at the top. It's just a network with some close relations, some loose relations. Some of them are already cancelled and are changed. Someone who's maybe on the left side of this network, left down, doesn't know what the person on the top right might be doing. And that's also intentional. Some people don't know their real names, so just know them by their nicknames. 
We will talk a little bit about how we were, came to research this topic and how we did it. And at the end, we will also answer questions. So how did we start researching this? How did we find Hannibal or how did Hannibal find us? In the beginning, there was a news report uh, like this, or probably actually this one. There was um, a search for terrorists in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, and one of our reporters did go there. We, there, we haven't, hadn't heard about Hannibal at this point, but something which stood out was that the Attorney General uh, didn't take in the police forces from Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, they were taken away from this investigation because they were also called to court uh, and also people who were involved in the military. And for this reason, they weren't uh, involved in this investigation. And for us, it was very much clear that they were all involved in a network. It was maybe 30 or 40 people. And as journalists, um, we wanted to learn from the NSU, which was a right terrorist organization in Germany and we wanted to do a better job this time and it was not only us but also other journalists and from this atmosphere this was a strategic decision and there was one person doing an interview in Panorama so our group is only, we are, it's called the prepper scene. Does it say anything to you? Preppers, that's just people who want to be prepared for a crisis, for a national catastrophe, if there is a limitation of resources, and we just want to be prepared. We just wanted to stock food and be ready to have our own energy, our own water, and have our own yeah, energy resources. So this is Marco G. You should also maybe take note of this name. We will come back to him later. He's a key figure in this Hannibal complex. He was the administrator of the Nordkreuz chat group, the one from the north. Marco G. is a police officer. He was at the LKA, he was in the special forces and was also in the armed forces and they are the people who are throwing bombs at uh, the enemy lines, so he's very well trained. And after this interview, everyone was relieved. Oh, it's just preppers, they are very harmless. And other people were like, well, they seem a bit crazy, but probably not very dangerous. And we learned about the scene at a road in close to Schwerin, where four people were meeting up, uh, and they were chatting about um, yeah, maybe we can get some trucks from the armed forces to get rid of left people on day X. And they were, yeah, prepping for day X. And when they are talking about the armed forces, that's not super far away for them because they are reservists, they are veterans from the armed forces. So that's very useful if there is a day X and if you have a truck from the armed forces, that might be super useful if there is the day X coming. And that sounds kind of funny maybe at first when the veterans are chatting about good old times at the army, but a lot of them are actually called back in uh, if there is a natural catastrophe or also for G20, G20 when it happened in Hamburg, they were called in. So, like, this reservist company uh, was called in for the G20, and one of, and the commander of this unit is uh, part of this prepper group from Nordkreuz. So uh, we noticed this, and so he was called away from this um, deployment. And we have questioned, are um, these people ex part of the extreme right? These are not uh, classical extreme right people. 
What we found is middle-aged men who were influenced uh, by migration uh, in 2015 to Germany and they got radicalized and sometimes in a very short time. And these men were thinking they had the one exclusive truth about the situation in Germany. And this exclusive truth was spread by Hannibal, who was spreading these news through these chat groups, who um, pretended to have this information as a part of the special unit, and they were in public. So they thought, yeah, that's, that must be it. And this is made possible by these networks of contacts. So this person might have this file which they have and it's very exclusive or in whatever way it's public. But there is actually no file from official agencies here. So we actually needed to form this file ourselves, so we needed to do our own research. So the prepper chats, which we had been talking about, um, they were already closed down when we started our research because Franco A was already like in the public at that point and we, some of these chats chat groups we were able to read through because they were brought to court, for example. So what did we do? A lot of our research was online. So we looked through over 200 lights from a, a picture of a wedding or through pictures of a bodyguard workshop, always looking for people who might be important or which we recognized. And sometimes we just guessed their profile names or just tried it out. Or we had a picture and tried to link it back to other profiles. Or sometimes we found uh, usernames or profiles we recognized from the chat, which we had. And so we found out about many connections and also found out lots of connections which were unknown previously. Instagram is also very popular but with these people and they can pose with weapons or with patches or cigar cigars. So if we researched this, then a lot of things and connections disappeared and they deleted posts, they deleted likes, they deleted profiles and cleaned out their connections. They are very active on Facebook. They invite each other to events or tell post about how cool this training was or how cool this patch looks or they share our research, uh, mostly not very favorably. And also, they are very active on LinkedIn. And I wasn't really aware that it's an actual social network where you can post and share stuff. So this is the profile of Hannibal. So he was, he's calling himself this name here, and he's using this Freemasons symbol right next to his name. And he is offering global crisis management, and 77 people endorse his military competence. And he has a very well-funded project here. And the Unitary Association we have already mentioned before, what do we see there? We have this organigram here, so it's not an agency, but this is just this association with a couple of hundred people and they have district leaders and a medical response unit, so it's a very complex structure. And they also have just dancing lessons or fan merch or a world map. Uniter pretends to be in 64 countries and active there. And they also have a website. And they are pretending that there are no radical uh, opinions in this association. Um, so if you look at this, maybe they are just thinking big and maybe they are a bit crazy, but they surely are harmless. And at least that's the picture Unita wants to pretend themselves to be. And mostly that actually works out for them. So the 
Secret services aren't really looking at them because they are just looking at these websites and think, yes, they must be harmless. So all their public uh, statements um, uh, are harmless and it's not registered as an extremist group. However, we found other things online as well, and this, for example, is a post from a friend in Philippines, and he took pictures at a UNITA meeting and uh, where they uh, are posing actively and uh, with uh, members of Duterte, and you could find this on Facebook, publicly available. Uh, you can also find things online that um, potentially are of interest but are not really relevant that much. One example, just to give, like, this is the first time we're presenting this, this is hyper-inclusive, this is Hannibal's dog. This is the dog, he's called E. Dot. Not really important, but you can find him if you uh, just look hard and long enough. And so all this research online is quite time consuming, but they were not the most decisive thing. The most important thing was to go outside. The most deciding things are not happening out online or are being deleted afterwards. And a lot of stuff you can only evaluate after you've talked to people. So what kind of online relation does actually matter in the real world outside? So that's when we started knocking on a lot of doors. We um, were around, we traveled extensively in all sorts of regions. We met up with people at very weird, strange places, such as McDonald's or in a one-unit house in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. It was always cold. It was usually in winter. Oh, yeah, that's all our symbolic pictures. Um, we would not have gone this far, like, to the right. This we're not. We didn't go to that location. Um, we had a bunch of um, folders at the end and, and we got internal documents and, and could look into investigative files. Um, and then after we started publishing, um, people were getting actually reaching out to us. So we started getting sources from the network that had left the network. And that was quite interesting and important for us because it was interesting on a content level. But it was also people who had the tendency to um, would be quite further right from us. And however, they reached out, but they watched this and witnessed that and then found that quite problematic and then reached out to us who were so much further left to them. Um, and so, yeah, so even people who might regard all of this a bit more relaxed, they found it problematic and reached out. Um, and people informed us that they were scared and they weren't really sure if they would be in danger and putting themselves in danger if they started talking to us. Those are potentially, those are people that used to be in Afghanistan and uh, so had uh, completely different high stress situations. So that was quite uh, concerning for us and uh, we were quite, and we started hearing about information of bounty being put out to people who were talking to the, to the journalists and that was obviously like for us um, much more important all of this done to start using secure channels of communication. So thank you very much to um, basically everybody who um, acted as an informant, who was a source. We would not have been able to do this work without you. Yes, so in the beginning when we started covering this, um, why was there no coverage about Hannibal? Um, why was there... Um, but then, from the beginning on, however, there was research done by big media houses like Focus, as we already mentioned, but also the, re, um, the one big important network of uh, research journalists in Germany. But then, I mean, mainly, it wasn't really the established uh, news media um, that were supporting us and uh, were, so there's like uh, this uh, reference to about media that's kind of like a meta-analysis um, and they were kind of asking, so where are the reactions, where are the other responses? Also, the the radio that is in Leipzig, they, they covered us and they invited us for a podcast uh, with Christina Schmidt, who is uh, leading the team there and talked to us and mainly talked to us about why the, the coverage um, 
about how far right does the, the German army actually stand is something that doesn't really happen. There was obviously like the, the internet public, um, there's a couple of important Twitter accounts that start like Reconquista Internet who started having, wanted to have a conversation um, if there isn't anything that's bigger or in a grander scheme. Um, really quickly, this research also reached the German parliament, uh, the, the state level, but also the, the regional and county levels. Um, we got a lot of uh, requests. Um, we have above 12 by now in the German parliament. Um, the thing with those is that they usually don't generate that much. They just kind of lead to there's no results found. We couldn't find conclusive um, hints, so we couldn't really, so you kind of realize in these kind of moments that it's so difficult. And I mean, this was also hard for us when you have Peter Tauber, who's the state secretary of the um, office, Federal Office of Defense. She, when he claims that she, his grandmother kept uh, canned food in her basement, is she also a prepper? Like, and then you have the, the head of the uh, Secret Service, the BND in Germany, who claims that they couldn't find um, right-wing terrorists amongst uh, the army. Um, and he officially stated that, and the, the Parliamentary um, Supervisory Commission uh, looked into the file again, but, um, and they, they um, made us, they asked for a special report that's yet to be completed about this network um, and supposedly is going to get us more insights. So what the MAD, so the Federal Office um, of the Military Counterintelligence, in German is abbreviated to MAD, um, what he could confirm is that Hannibal's relation exists, like this kind of connection. This is a source. Um, Hannibal was already talking about the chats in Unita um, and his connections into the Secret Service was Dieter V. Um, you can see him without his head here. Obviously, like this is uh, a lawful picture. He's an informant, so his privacy has to be protected. Um, earlier this year, he was on trial in Cologne because he was under suspicion to warn Hannibal um, when about general attorney actions uh, and searches um, of checking special forces, police officers' houses to discover the network of uh, police and army of the special forces. They couldn't find much in Hannibal's place because um, that's partially due because a laptop and a couple other uh, resources uh, disappeared and there's the suspicion that Dita V was involved in warning him and tipping him off and but this couldn't be proven in court so he was uh, he was not convicted of this um, so we have this network and the Secret Service, um, but my colleague Christina Schmidt and I, in February, on a very cold winter evening, we rang a doorbell in Stuttgart. In a, we wanted to talk to Ringo M. We found his name in the membership book. Um, he was one of the founding members in 2016, and he was the, 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 the head of the founding committee. And so this was a normal person to talk to if you want to know him. Man some of you might know him. He was formerly called Ringo L. He was a police officer and a colleague and the supervisor of Michel Kiesewetter, who was the last victim of the NSU. So we are at this house. This is like a multiple-story building, and uh, we are uh, ringing at the bell. Uh, we see someone's there because the light uh, is there, but we ring and the light is switched off and the door on the inside is shut. So obviously people don't want to talk to us. So what we do is usually we leave a note. And Christina and Christina Schmidt uh, started writing and she wasn't finished yet. Um, there was like a small, um, when we could hear the doors being shut on the ground level and we could see a Porsche Cayenne leaving and there's four men going 
to the building and we we're like could do much so we left and like went downstairs and asked who those were who was there and uh, Ringo M introduced himself and the other one introduced himself as his lawyer but he wasn't a lawyer um, Ringo M however did want to talk he was there in his uh, slippers and socks um, it was cold February evening so then we like chatted it was it was now or never this chance would never come up again so then we asked him how what happened with this with association and we noticed that he really shortly after left the club again and he's like yeah that was that was because of my employer and we're like oh who was the employer was it in federal office was it a private company he didn't really want to respond to that um, so we had our own suspicions about this who the employer could be um, but you um, are working for the office of the protection of the Constitution and he said no which is a lie um, and we could prove that and we could clearly write that so the interior ministry of uh, Baden-Württemberg confirmed this and there was obviously a bit of a fuss about this because we have this person who's a member of the protection of the constitution of the federal office for the protection of the constitution and a few months later he um, after founding the club, he takes a back seat. And then shortly after that, Franco A is being uh, discovered, uh, who's also a quite active member of um, this um, association. So the federal agency for the protection of the constitution would be responsible for researching this association. Are they actually what they say they are or are they something else? But are, can they actually be neutral about this association if their own employee is uh, also a founding member of this association? And well, Probably they cannot. So let's look at the results our research actually had. So, uh, yeah, there were some consequences. So some people actually distance themselves from UNITO. So here we see this area in Mosbach where there were paramilitary trainings. And the minister, interior ministry uh, distanced himself and uh, put Ringo M away to an other ministry and said he was only there privately and he was not there on like an official uh, deploy. No. The police started investigating against one police officer. The weapon producer Heckler and Koch uh, also distanced themselves from this association and the UNITER uh, logo was on their uh, public images. Also, Sixt uh, quit, uh, some people were thrown out there, and also the energy concern company LVE also reacted. Uniter members uh, had, uh, uh, they were deployed at Hambacher Forst, uh, and they um, were also cancelled this connection. And other groups were more hesitant to cancel more connections. And they are kind of good in what they are doing. They train military tactics with uh, weapons which look like actual weapons, but they are actually toys, but they are super, super close to how they really are, but they are not forbidden. So if you're registered uh, for being able to use these weapons or if you're working in an agency, then it's legal. So if there is a day X, then you can are able to combine these things. So you have people who are able to shoot and people who are uh, informed about military tactics. So you can combine these connections. So this network was publicized before a day X to a kind of early time. So nothing dangerous happened with this group now. So it makes it harder to like have a final result, a final line about how dangerous they actually are. So 
the, the, the secret agency is actually um, marking these people as dangerous um, now, and including Franco. Um, a and uh, a lot of them were just radicalized very quickly in the very short time of weeks or sometimes months, uh, which you don't usually see. So they aren't well-known right, extreme right people, but they were radicalized around 2015 and then became right extremists. So they aren't, they don't have the picture of a closed set of mind about right-wing ideology, but what they have is a strong racism and they are they see the left as enemies and they see the Antifa as enemies. Und, uh, diese Analyse stammt gar nicht von uns, obwohl sie von uns so this analysis doesn't really come from us. Um, uh, it comes der, from uh, the uh, Office of the Protection of the Constitution. Um, and they deal with like how we're supposed to deal with right-wing terrorism. And um, the first thing they state is what they're missing. Um, often this is taken as an entry point for um, the um, Secret Service to investigate. So this was public even before the research was done, and they are saying that um, they want to be able to check into the smartphones to read chats. And let's look back to Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, where our research began. And in June the, of this year, there were uh, investigations and they were searching houses from members of the special forces because they were storing a lot of ammunition and weapons and they were stolen from official police uh, weapons. And they uh, collected them and Marco G, uh, Marco G who have we already seen in the Panorama interview early on, and they are collecting these weapons for day X. And there is 60,000 parts of ammunition they are collecting. And so something else happened in summer of this year. People were informed uh, who were on an enemy list, which was one of the mo most central lists, which was found. They weren't informed to be warned uh, or be like, um, hey, be careful, someone is planning something, but the, they were called to court to be witnesses and through this they were informed they are on these lists. And through this also a lot of other people were informed which were on these lists, which were probably not the most in danger. So officially no one ever uh, is really at risk on this list. So there are eight levels and they are on the second lowest level for this risk uh, analysis. So the people who were got getting these letters, they were, really they were not really informed what it was about. So they called us, so what does this mean to get this letter? And the interior minister uh, in mecklenburg vorpommern in 2017, he said, yeah, these preppers, we are not really sure how many there are or whether they are dangerous. And he started a commission, a prepper commission, uh, with uh, the um, educators for political education. Uh, and this commission should publish a report, and that has not happened to this day. We also don't know them, but we do know some secret files from this commission. And so what has this commission actually found out? Not much. So first of all, they have not really looked at Nordkreuz, so not at the official investigations. They haven't really found anything about the police, because of the police reports, because preppers aren't really called out there. And then they were like, yeah, let's look online. And one uh, member of the 
agency to protect the constitution um, was also involved and he presented some of the results and he found that there are Facebook groups which are open and some which are closed and perhaps are organized through that and in the open groups nothing problematic is happening and in the closed groups we just don't know because we can't get in there and that's too hard to get in and that's the level this commission was investigation investigating this thing and what do we call them what do we call this problematic preppers like there must be good proper preppers which like just are preparing themselves for catastrophes which can't be a bad thing and then there must be bad preppers and then they coin this, try to coin a special term for them ready prey but like this probably won't catch on and then the media published something which didn't really confirm what they tried to publish in their report, so they just postponed publishing it. So then we, they said, let's just publish what we have so far, and then we have an internal note that the report is not uh, very well done, so we can't really publish it, so it's still not published. And then there was another commission which was looking at the Special Forces force Unit, and they should look at what the SEK, the Special Forces, are doing, what they are doing for to prepare for day X and so on, and one of them is in front of a court now. And this report is saying that in one of three of these SEK groups, um, people are uh, ca like racist and th there is a lack of attention of, the, um, of their bosses, so it's kind of a disaster. In a normal world, this probably would call for them stepping down. In Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, it apparently doesn't. So he is just being moved to a different department to in the police. And they, are, they just want to hire more women because then it's less problematic for some reason. And then there are personal consequences. Two police officers are just, again, being deployed to an other uh, agencies, and one of them is now at a special force in the police, and one is in the Agency for the Protection of the Constitution. There's also the other um, court case that's happening right now. So this is uh, Marco G., um, Marco G was uh, on trial in Schwerin. In December, he was put on trial because of violations against the weapons law and uh, the ammunition law and um, the um, attorneys, uh, prosecutors took uh, 45 minutes to uh, read the list um, of accusations. And Marco G. In Nordkreuz, I mean, Nordkreuz was not really part of this. Um, this was maybe the the cause for collecting all these weapons, or a motive. But it, this was not what the court case was really about. Marco G. Um, answered questions written and verbally. He said, "Yes, maybe I was a bit." Um, sloppy with this ammunition, and yes, this rifle that I stole from the army, um, I bought it on this like dark back alley, and then I kind of forgot it at my um, at my wife's parents and my chats. Yes, well, they were there, but they were completely um, unpolitical, so they were not politically motivated. So let's do this uh, counter test. So. Um, the parliament uh, believes the um, chat called Connect4 as a right-wing terrorist. He was part of this chat. Um, there was a trial. Um, there was a police officer who was there, and he analyzed this chat conversation, and he could only analyze part of this chat group because because there was a lot of deletions done before 2017 but there was a lot of other chats that he could evaluate and analyze 
and he, Marco G, brought one of the stereotypical classical cases on the 20th of April. He sent a picture around of Adolf Hitler um, with the subtitle, Happy Birthday. Um, he shared photos of army officers pointing a gun at somebody and underneath it it read, um, your, your seeking of asylum is being denied. Um, so this appeared in the court case and uh, was discussed extensively. Um, but regardless of these facts, um, all of these, um, were, the, the, the case was dealt with quite lightly. Um, Marco G, uh, the judge in this case, said that after a first search of um, his house, there was found a lot of ammunition. But before the second, um, he had a lot of less illegal ammunition. And he got more or less illegal ammunition. And the judge interpreted this as taking a step into the right direction. Um, well, this is a way that you can see this. Um, so the judge also considered, well, how do I say this, um, an advantage um, that he kept book about his income because he said that claimed that terrorists do not do bookkeeping. So this uh, was, uh, yeah, so he got a year and nine months um, and on Christmas he was released on uh, bail and was with his mother over Christmas. So this, this court case really proves how difficult it is to um, deal with this network on a lawful level, on a justice level. Um, so let's look in the northeast of the Republic of Germany again. Um, so we have this group, not Kreuz, we have this group by Marco G. And part of this group, we have two people that are being investigated um, in prepping for um, a quite grave um, attack. So this is technically considered terrorism, prepping for a terroristic attack. Um, and part of this group, there's also the founder of this group, Marco G, who together with, we don't know this yet, there's still investigation going on, um, obtained ammunition and got it illegally. And uh, But also some of the stuff he was allowed legally to own. Um, so all of this stuff was hoarding, was hoarded for day X, for getting ready, and he's, um, the verdict was announced. But um, the attorney general, um, the prosecutor um, really, like, filed for appeal. So this is not the final um, ruling. So a lot of people are questioning now, why is there no investigation of um, terroristic unit? Um, a terroristic association. The general attorney um, that's responsible for this asked himself this question clearly. Um, if it's possible to start this investigation, um, he didn't see any reasons to start this investigation and it couldn't prove this goal of having a politically motivated terroristic act. So this procedure in, was then given to the local trial in Schwerin, so then it was dealt with regionally. Here we can see also that this kind of separation of cases, so one part of the group has this list of enemies, another person has the ammunition, and maybe a third party has the guns. This can be a coincidence, but maybe this is also the strategy. Um, so also the um, BKA, so the German police, the German criminal police, um, this is Holger Münch, is the president of this um, office. Um, this is an example where he introduces how you do investigation and you can see he did it a bit better in the overview department but this report that we mentioned that's for the super supervisory committee um, this is going to get quite interesting however this one is secret um, but there is opposition um, party leaders who want it to be made public at least in a shorter version unita uh, maybe everybody knows by now um, a couple of weeks ago there was this affair about robert muritz who was a local party member from uh, lower saxony uh, no from uh, sachsen-anhalt um, 
and he also has a quite right-wing past and he's got the black sun tattooed on his body which is always put into association with the SS um, so he was but then he claimed to only be interested in the Celtic mythology and you always ask yourself what would have happened if he would have been interested in Wales um, it would have to be a family tattoo um, with the size of things. So the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, almost um, made parliament resolve ab ab over this case because the Green Party wanted this this person to leave the party it belonged to. There was, And then Robert Müritz himself um, decided to step down and resolve these issues for the, for the current government. So um, the CDU, he, I mean, he could have also said something about being distancing himself from this right-wing um, ideas, but instead he chose to step down from the CDU. Um, so obviously it's become very clear that right-wing terrorists are quite comfortable joining UNITA and, um, I mean, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, who's the head of the CDU, she sees this a, bit, a little bit different. Um, she does say that if you um, if you put a sign of the unit or si like uh, if you label yourself with their signals, like you do, kind of associate yourself with right wing oriented groups. What does Hannibal do? Like Hannibal um, officially stepped down. Um, he was given a sword upon leaving. He also left the German army, and he will shortly be put on trial. Um, for violating the weapons law. And what does the MAD do? Just to um, sum this up and to, f to finish this up, after um, the killing of Walter Lübcke and the Hannibal affair and further research that was done on right-wing and right extremist um, cells within the army and the police departments. The um, state police is supposed to be restructured um, and the Federal Office for Military Counterintelligence Services is uh, hit quite hard on this regard. There's supposed to be more civilians. The civilians vice president um, of the MAD is supposed to be put in state. They have about 200 members. So there's quite a few, and there's another position that's supposed to be made part of the uh, defense ministry um, that, so that they can have um, disciplinary measurements against um, right-wing ideology within these uh, forces. So this year also, um, also in this public hearing of the heads of the secret intelligence services, um, Herr Gramm uh, said again whether or not we have networks of right-wing extremists in the army. And he said short, in short, I would like to say no, yes. Um, we've often tried to understand this terminology. On the one hand, we have a network. For one person, it's three people doing a phone call with one another and exchanging each other over um, how bad our, um, chan like our chancellor is because... Um, because she's doing horribly on the migration politics. For other people, it's a much larger group that wants to threaten the uh, free democratic order of our um, country. And this is how we understand it from a lawful state. This is how it's stated in paragraph four um, in uh, the book that protects our constitution. Um, and it's clearly we're not blind towards these kind of n networks that are building beyond these closed groups. Um, we kind of use this term of the shadow army and we can clearly see that there's people who are building connections below this threshold so even constitution um, in danger is they can connect they can influence each other in their in their um, anti-constitutional um, spirit and we can clearly find this kind of connections in the German army so we got a yes no maybe so it's not a network but they are connected so we just have to keep on researching and this is what we will be doing so if you want to read our texts you find it at tats 
www.hadibal.de dash Hadibal and also we have a hashtag so uh, we would be happy if you would pay us voluntarily thank you so much for your attention and if you have any questions please ask them uh, you are listening to the translation of the talk about the Hadibal affair by Simply Say M and Katie Zana. If you have feedback, you can use the hashtag C3T on Twitter and, or email us at hello at c3lingo.org. We have some more time for questions. So, the internet, uh, a lot of people are saying thank you over IRC, and they ask about professional connections uh, to the Stay Behind and Gladio networks by the CIA. That's a very popular question from the beginning. Uh, and to make this connection between Gladio and Hannibal, we are looking for those connections, what there are continuations between those networks or organizations, uh, maybe they were called differently earlier on. So far, we haven't found any resu results that there are connections or continuations between those networks. Question. Do you know how many uh, secret agencies in Germany have this very limited picture of right-wing right extremism? Do you know how this comes? Yeah, well, there are several theories. Throughout this research, a lot of these agencies were saying, there is nothing to be found here. And we questioned ourselves if we are looking at something and are seeing something that actually isn't there. But there were different motivations to keep on going. Um, I grew up in eastern Germany with people with baseball bats and people are, were saying there isn't anything but I was feeling there is. So we are kind of a diverse group uh, who was aware that we should be keep going to research this. So just hashtag diversity, um, if there are only white men saying yeah this is the case and have some all have the same training in the military and I know diversity is a soft term, but if you look at German security agencies, that's actually uh, not at all there. It's just all white men and there are no diversity of views and opinions and identities. So then there is also this aspect of personal connections and personal just pe people just being close to each other. And also, if we were actually talking to one of those people or standing right in front of them, we were like, is this actually a Nazi? Is he an extreme right person? Is he just like a crazy old person? Or is he actually dangerous? It's not really easy to say. It's not for us and it's also not uh, easy to to say for official agencies who have these legal terms which they have to be using. So that's not um, a bad thing to do that because if we were only uh, using this for our own assumptions about this, then it would not only be used for the right people but also for the left spectrum. So I'm not sure if this precisely answers the question. Uh, let's look at back at diversity. Christina Schmidt. Uh, our colleague uh, is unfortunately not available today, but she has, for example, done a podcast with Katasha. You find it online. Another question from the Internet. Are there any personal consequences for you after this research was done? Any uh, attacks? Yeah, Sebastian mentioned this example when there are people suddenly in front of you and there is some mails which may be uh, people threatening to kill us, but not very specific. 
not specifically to this research. There is stuff, very rarely stuff directly linked to that. There are a lot of people who don't really like us. Uh, if you, for example, look at Uniter, uh, they were um, calling in their lawyers uh, early on and later they were just answering themselves and a lot of it was very funny actually. So in the beginning that were the tactics, uh, they were in the beginning calling in their lawyers and tried to intimidate us, but that just resolved itself. Hello. Yeah. Another question. Thank you so much for your research. A question about day X, which you've mentioned a lot of times. Are there stronger, like better definitions? Uh, who's defining this and who is actually saying now we have day X? Good question. There is no really good definition. What is this day X? There is some kind of public uh, statements, there might be a power outage. If there is a power outage for two or three days, that's not very unrealistic. But what uh, it is about is the order in the state if this breaks down. So there is no super clear definition within the networks. It's about having too many migrants and they are overrunning us and then we are no one else is protecting us, so we have to do it ourselves. So it's not a super clear definition. So, for example, in Hamburg during G20, there was a fire. So maybe they can call, just a small group can call that day X. And um, so this could be also done artificially. So Franco uh, A might be also involved here. We are not really clear if there is a connection. So. I, myself, as a pretended refugee, might plan an attack and then other people have to react to that. So, yeah, again, there is no clear definition. It's kind of weird. There is only time for one more question, but there are many more questions in the audience. In the slide about the networks, there was a mention of Timo H, uh, who was also connected to the NSU terrorist group. What's their connection? These connections we have done here are not directly to the NSU, but they are connected to Michel Kieselwecker, that are the last victim of the NSU, who were also in the, pol the police unit around her. So Ringo was, Ringo M was also involved with this, and he was uh, already noted because he was training illegally police people in Libya, and we are not sure if there is any significance to that, but it was kind of notable that there were people showing up again, and here's this person who is a member of the AFD, the right party in the German, uh, German parliament. So there is connection to the Ku Klux Klan. It's, it's kind of notable, but we are not sure about the significance this has. Yeah. Thank you again for this research. Um, this has been the translation of the talk about the Hannibal Affair, again done by Simply Say M and Katie.